Okay, so um, thank you very much for that introduction, uh, Martin, and uh, for giving me free reign on the microphone, although I'm not sure whether that's a good thing, given a, an Irish man a free stage to start talking, we could be here for a while. Um, so my name is, is Mark Glynn and I work for Dublin City University, and um, if I had responded to Martin's uh, queries on time, we probably would have had a bigger audience here because I, I didn't give enough information to promote the session, so my apologies for that, Martin. Um, but the session will be recorded and I have no problem with anybody sharing it widely and if interested, I can answer any follow-up questions afterwards if, uh, if you have that interest there. Um, <clears throat> just in terms of what we are doing and, and uh, what elements we're going to be chatting about, um, I've broken down the, the, the talk into uh, an introduction to ourselves, to myself and, and to our organisation, and uh, then just a, a little bit about GDPR, because I'm sure you're all um, overjoyed by the, the, the concept that is coming up, but also um, bored to tears with the, the introductions to GDPR. So I'll risk through that as quick as possible. But what I want to do is focus on them uh, with relation, with specific reference to teaching and learning, specific reference to GDPR in the classroom. And um, I'm not here to chat about the data you collect in your research. I'm not here to talk about the data that your institution may collect on you or anybody else. Um, just teaching and learning is what we'll, we'll, we'll focus on. Um, and I've labeled uh, some, uh, a section on GDPR myths. And this is basically responses that I've got from staff when I've mentioned GDPR, when I've explained GDPR to them. And I've came up with four, the four of the most popular ones. Um, and what I'd like to do as well is ask you to, to uh, contribute to those within when the time comes uh, within the discussion section, within the, uh, the, the webinar, within Blackboard Collaboration. And then I want to finish off really by giving some classroom examples and saying what we currently do and what we will no longer be doing and indeed what we currently do and we're still able to do with uh, GDPR when it comes in on May 25th. Okay, so um, that's 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 what we're what we're going to cover, and uh, let's let's kick into it now. So DCU Dublin City University, just by the numbers, we've uh, over seventeen thousand students. I believe actually close to, to eighteen thousand students. Um, <clears throat> we've over one and a half thousand staff. When you start including in part-time distance academics, it's it's an awful lot of staff added on top of that. We are still classed as what's uh, considered a young university. We we're established in 1989. We were the closest UK equivalent to it beforehand. We were um, like a polytechnic. We we're an institute for higher education from 1981 to 1989. Um, not quite a direct comparison, uh, but, but the closest to it. And we were, I say in inverted commas, upgraded to a university in 1989. We are spread across three academic campuses and uh, we have five faculties and 28 schools. I'm very aware that within your institution, you may have schools and, and uh, departments, or you may have departments and faculties or whatever. It's, the same thing, just different labels. So five, five faculties and 28 schools. Um, <clears throat> because we're spread over three academic campuses, it makes my job that little bit harder um, and we have to do everything in, in triplicate, but uh, hopefully the same message is spread across the, the 28 schools. Each one of those schools run their own programs and they don't typically tend to have learning technologists or learning design people within it. They're typically made up of administration staff and academics and the learning design and the learning technologies done centrally. Okay. We have, sorry, excuse me, just taking a glass of water there. We have um, a couple of, of networks that we're involved in and a couple of what I refer to as badges um, that we, we quite I proudly stick out on our chest. Obviously, the, the, the university rankings were the top 50 under 50. Um, we are very much a believer of the Athena Swan um, initiatives, which 
um, I think it's it's five of our uh, four of our five faculties. Um, uh, the deans are, are female, and indeed, when you go down into the twenty eight schools, it's a, it's a strong mix of females as well. And we're involved in two key networks, European networks, um, uh, the European Consortium of Innovative Universities and the Young European Research Universities. And I, I will mention them specifically later on um, as it relates to some of the, the research that we're doing related to teaching and learning. I head up the teaching enhancement unit. So um, the, our goal, I'm not going to read through it there, our, our, our mission essentially um, is there in front of you, but we are responsible for five different elements. So developing staff, uh, helping with curriculum design, and um, issuing out teaching and learning awards. We actually have our main teaching and learning awards on tomorrow, but we also issue out small bursaries to support staff. And we foster and support scholarship teaching and learning by encouraging staff to, to write articles, by co-writing with, with staff, and indeed by, by mentoring their, their, um, their own applications or indeed um, um, publications, uh, submissions that are putting out. But the very last one is Loop. Loop is the family of learning technologies that we use. And it's particularly relevant to today because all the data is in there. So what is what is in Loop? Loop is Moodle, is our learning management system, our virtual learning, uh, our virtual webinar rooms is managed by Adobe Connect. We have our uh, plagiarism text matching service, is what I prefer to call it. Our, our, our text matching service is by Orkin. We recently moved from Turnitin. And um, we also have our video capture system is Unicam. And I say video capture as opposed to lecture capture. And I, I, again, we'll get onto that later on. And um, then we, we also have Google Drive and everything that goes with the Google Drive suite. So that's where the data comes into it from, from, uh, from my point of view, from my unit's responsibilities. Just for those of you that, that, that may not be aware, um, there's this thing called GDPR. It is coming out on May 25th. Um, uh, again, I don't particularly tend to need slides word for word um, within, uh, they're there for, for, for you to, to go through. And actually, as, as Martin said before the instruction, a copy of all these slides will be available for you to cut, paste, plagiarize, harvest, whatever term that you uh, feel uh, comfortable with, I've no problem in you using these if they're of any benefit to you whatsoever. So that's, that's what, what GDPR is. But as I said at the start, what I want to do is focus on the teaching and learning data. So focus on the assessment data, focus on the VLE data, focus on the lecture capture data, and get your, your views as well. I'm not here. Uh, claiming to be the, the oracle of knowledge here. I'm learning as much as you are. Uh, what I'm doing here is, is really just giving our own account of what's happened in, in our own institution. But the focus very much for me is on the teaching and learning side. We have great data protection people here. Um, Martin and, and uh, his colleague Noel, uh, I, not for one second would I want to take their job. Um, but it, it would kill me by anything else. But um, it is it is to me the focus is on teaching and learning for for today's session. In terms of the who am I, I am um, I'm a multitasking. I'm the fella on the left hand side of the screen there, wearing more hats than the bono. But what I am not is I'm not a solicitor. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a judge. I'm not a legal person of any stretch of the imagination whatsoever. So. Uh, in recording, you have it now here, so what I'm saying is, is my uh, experience and thoughts. It is not legal advice, and please don't take it as so. Okay? Um, and you'll hear me repeat that on several occasions throughout the session. So, in our institution, and I've no doubt it's the same as your own, in our institution, we get our students to register every single year. Uh, and they may just be rolling over from first year to second year, second to third, and so on. But we get them to re-register every year and register the first time uh, when they come into us from secondary school or wherever uh, avenue they, they've joined the university. But 
What we now have to be more conscious of, and I'm not saying that we weren't conscious beforehand. I'm not saying that these rules didn't exist beforehand because they did. There are UK and Irish and international data protection regulations before uh, May 25th. But what we're very conscious of now, before our students sign on the dotted line, we're very conscious of security of the data, privacy of the data, and deleting the data, and then limiting the collection of the data. And I'll go through each, each one of them in, in, uh, uh, in their own right. Uh, but the security of the data literally comes down to make sure we don't let it get, we don't let people the wrong people see the data. We don't let the data be leaked out about it. And it's something we might have been blasé in the past, um, or we might have realized that we shouldn't be sharing up with certain people. And that's something else that we need to get to. And that also picks, uh, follows on to the privacy of the data. So who sees what assessment marks the students got? So um, Vicky, Sue, and Al, they're all in the same class. Is it okay for Vicky to see Sue's grades or Al to see Vicky's grades? And we, we go into that. And then there's the deleting of the data. Part of the new legislation is this whole thing about the right to be forgotten. But can, can you delete a student's assessment data? Should you delete a student's assessment data? And then there's the, the limiting of, of uh, the collection of data. And I'll give you a, a real example of that. We asked our students to tell us how long they're spending on particular assignments. And we got an array of responses where like 40% of them said they spent um, less than one day on an assignment. On the, on the same survey, 30% of the students, and, and, and referring to the same assessment, 30% um, of the students said they spent more than three weeks on the data. But we limited the collection on purpose. We told them it was an anonymous survey and that it was just their views we were looking for. But after reading that data and interpreting it, I'd be there thinking, oh God, I would have loved if I had, I had their student name so I could have actually came back into their profile to figure out what grades they got in the assignment afterwards. But because we limited the collection on purpose and we, we had full transparency with the student and took the route of anonymous thing, we, we couldn't just collect data just for the sake of it, in the hope that we might use it again. Um, <clears throat> so what's new? And for me, this is, this is, I got this quote from a colleague, uh, uh, sort of more knowledgeable on than me, is our accountability, is, is the fines, is the money, right, associated with it. The, the legislation was there before, has been there before, and will, um, Nothing major has changed. There are slight uh, important uh, changes, but the biggest one is our accountability and the money. Up to twenty percent. Oh, sorry, up to four percent of our GDP, uh, of our turnover, is what we could be fined. Um, and up to twenty million, I think, was the one of the latest figures I think by around. And for organisations uh, like our own and like so many of the people here that are in the audience, where we're having cutbacks left, right, and centre. Um, we can't afford to be hit with these fines. We will be hit by them if we breach them, but we can't afford to be. Uh, so we must do our utmost to make sure that we take take action to, to avoid it. Um, okay, so, <clears throat> and this is the bit, and I've, I've another, uh, just one more slide after this, which is very worthy, and uh, then we'll get it in straight into the, the, the myths. And please, if you do have any questions or comments or anything along those lines, please feel free to, to text them in or interrupt at any particular stage. Or if you feel more comfortable to leave them till the end, I have no problem with that either. So here are the, the, the principles of GDPR. Um, again, I won't read through each of them um, in, in turn, but I do want to concentrate on the top one because concentrating on the, the, the teaching and learning side, I want to, to concentrate on, on being, are we being fair? Are we, um, are we being transparent in what we're doing and the data that we're processing, are we doing it lawfully? And so I wanted to, to uh, hone in on that, particularly the last one, the lawful processing, because this is where people make no mistake, in, in my opinion. 
Again, very wordy slide, but because I'm not a lawyer, because I'm not of a legal background, I've literally cut and pasted this so I didn't make any personal interpretation and therefore mistake in presenting this data to you. But um, like the last list, you can read through it at your, your, your leisure there, and I'll leave it up for, for a while. Um, but I want to concentrate on the top two, the consent and the performance of a contract. So I'm just going to give you a second to read through that slide, and then I'm going to come back to the top two. Okay, being academics, sorry, sorry, being academics, we have uh, probably learned the art of speed reading, so I won't leave the blank space for too long. But I do want to come back to the top two, as I said. Um, consent and uh, performance of a contract, right? You are not going to get consent from for everything that you do from students, just from a practical point of view. Um, we have, as I say, just over 17,000 students. And when one student turns around and says, well, no, I don't want you to use my data and give it to Turnitin or to give it to Orchid. But if that's part of the service that we provide uh, and it's part of the requirement of the college, well, then consent doesn't even come into it. It is performance of a contract. If um, a student said, well, I don't want my data being shared with our institutional researcher to report metrics back to the higher education authority, a student has no choice. That is performance of a contract. Um, somebody might turn around and say, well, I want to profile the students within our institution. That's not part of the contract. That's something where you need to have consent. And the difference with consent is, come May 26th, if we just to avoid any confusion, come May 26th, the day after the legislation kicks into effect, is... Um, Consent has to be explicit. They have to opt in rather than opt out. So in the past, you used to be able to say, if you disagree with it, tick this box. But you can, uh, you assumed a, a consent in that case. You can no longer do that anymore. So for me, as educational, institu uh, as educational institutions and uh, teaching and learning issues, we need to push more towards the, the data that we collect under the performance of a contract rather than under the, the heading of consent. So um, <clears throat> I, I will I, I'll just get to your question, Santu, just in a, in a second. Um, but as much as we can do to push it under performance of a contract, it, it's just a tighter piece. It, 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 it's a more secure uh, element for when it comes to lawful processing of it. Now, there are bits that we won't be able to push in, uh, and that's where consent is required. I mentioned profiling as, as one of them, um, but, and, and, and sending additional data or additional information to them. But if it's required as part of the contract, well, then it's something that, that just gives us more of a solid standing. And that's not just because I'm concentrating on consent and performance. That's not saying uh, that the others are equally valid, the legal obligation, the protection of the vital interest, public interest, legitimate interest. Um, you might, in the case of learning analytics, be able to push something under legitimate interest. Um, however, I think consent and performance of the contract are, are the ones that we will use most. Uh, as a sector, I'm not necessarily saying DC specifically, but as a sector, I think we'll use more of the consent versus uh, and the consent and the performance of a contract rather than the others. So, Santi, just coming back, uh, a general disclaimer and notice for recommended technologies. Very good question. Um, for me, what's happened in the last couple of weeks, we have sent around the notes to staff saying what technologies to use and the array of technologies that we've got. And to be honest, and our, our staff, I would, I would put up against the best of them. I'm very, very proud of our staff, but there, there, 
there's some of them that the practices they have, they've been giving away email addresses and giving away student numbers and giving away all sorts of different bits and pieces and giving away the, out of ignorance more so than, than, than out of uh, complicit breaking of the, of the law or explicit breaking of the law. It's not good practice. So what we are doing, you may have seen a presentation there last week or two weeks ago possibly from uh, Moodle, we're a Moodle institution where they have actually recommended and they've built a plugin um, to have specific policies. So wherever possible, we're going to have a specific policy for each technology that we use and that we endorse. Um, not ones that, that are additional, but ones that are part of the course. And this is why I was asking about using Echo 360 or Blackboard Collaborate or Orkin or what else have it. So we're going to have a specific policy for them and then we will look at individuals that use Twitter and Padlet and um, MindGarden and a variety of other bits and pieces. But it is something that I would, I would welcome discussion on uh, what other people are doing in this area because um, I don't claim to be an expert on it. I can only share the experience of, of what we've done and what I know others have done. Uh, but to try and list and get consent for everything or indeed have them listed uh, on your VLE shirt. Sure, how long is this uh, piece of string? It's just, it's an incredibly long list. So um, <clears throat> we are, and, and it's something I, I will share with you and share with everybody here the wording when we finally agree it. Uh, but I'll, I'll share the wording that we will be using with Mo or for Moodle, for Adobe Connect, for Orkind, for Unicam, and uh, any of the other central services that, that we will be putting on. Um, I'm just waiting on our legal people to actually approve that for us. So I want to uh, move on and talk about MIT. And again, this is something that I would, I would welcome your contributions here and your comments in um, in uh, what you came across with regards to GDPR. I'm going to pull up four to start the conversation and then I'll open it up to the floor um, to, to add in some more after that. So just uh, recapping really on the last slide, uh, some people have turned around and said to me, oh, well, consent is required for everything. This is going to mess us up. We're going to have to get consent for, uh, and the students have to actively take off that they, they consent for Turnitin to have their diary they, or data, they consent for Adobe Connect to have their data. Absolutely not. There are seven different categories as I went through, seven different options on that awful process, and consent is only one of them. And for me, the biggest one, and I emphasize again, the biggest one we want to push all of our data, we're actively uh, pushing all of our data through, is under the performance of a contract. Um, because it's so easy for a student not to give consent. Um, and that's not taking away from their, their rights. I don't mean to belittle their rights whatsoever, but it's so easy for them not to give consent. And then what do you do? Then, then where are you left? Um, the dark data, I love that phrase, Alison. I've never heard it before, but with your permission, I'd like to use it again. The dark data that concerns me, the assessments, the feedback, and, and they re uh, reside on the academics' PCs. And you know what I found out recently? Some of them reside home PCs, not even their university property. Um, oh, frightening the practices that I've, I've came across. And they said, well, I need a particular piece of software, so I need to use my own laptop. The school doesn't supply me with a laptop. Or they only supply me with a PC and not a laptop, and I need to go into the classes to present this stuff. But then they have an Excel spreadsheet which has all the students' grades on it. Or they might, as you say, have all the feedback there. Yeah, it is the dark data. It is really worrying. Um, <clears throat> so, myth number two, or two, students can now get all of their data deleted. And I, I, I'm glad Alison mentioned that dark data because related to that is their dark data. They can't delete their, their assignment data. We have monthly meetings, as I'm sure you do in your own institution, where we have, amongst other things, we discuss students who have put in a request saying, oh, I started my degree 20 years ago and I only got to year three, but then had to drop out for whatever reason. 
uh, I now want to come back and finish off my last year. Well, if we deleted all their data, if we deleted their assignment submissions and the results and everything, else, we couldn't facilitate that along those lines. If we deleted data, we couldn't stand over um, our data that we report to, to um, the Higher Education Authority or to the Department of Education. If that data doesn't exist, if the students choose to delete it, it leaves holes and weaknesses in our, our reporting. So no, students can't delete all of their data, um, plain and simple. They cannot do it. It is up to us to explain, and I mean us in the collaborative term, all of us as educational institutions, to explain to them what data they can delete and what data they can't, and explain to them why. And that comes under the transparency, um, transparency uh, element of the legislation. So any idea, Vicky has just put in any idea on how long they should attain or retain the data. I found um, different institutions have, have different, uh, different policies in place. What our data protection people are, are endorsing is an approach of collect as little as possible and store it for as little as possible. And then we'll trip ourselves up as little as possible. So, um, and that minimize the amount of data that you're collecting and minimize how long you store it for. Um, we have a year and a day for hard copies uh, and, and electronic copies of individual exam scripts and I believe of the marks we store them indefinitely but a year and a day I think for the exam submissions. Um, but again I'm not saying that's the best way to do it but that's just the way that DCU have chosen, the, the approach we've chosen. Um, another myth which uh, didn't get the biggest amount of laughs because the last one's got the biggest amount of laughs was uh, GDPR only affects organizations if you're in the EU. Uh, we have a campus in, in Saudi Arabia and somebody from Saudi Arabia says, oh sure, GDPR doesn't apply for us. And uh, it does. Wherever you have, even if it's only one uh, EU citizen in your data set, you're subject to GDPR. And actually, uh, and it is good data, and I give out, or it is good legislation, I give out about the four letters of GDPR, and it's given me nightmares at the moment in the volume of work that is generated, but I still think it's good legislation, and so do others. Canada are looking at what GDPR are doing to US, they're looking at what GDPR is bringing in, so um, it is recognised as a good move. But I'm not denying that it's a pain in the neck for us at this moment in time. Um, what about retention of uh, student generated data such as form posts? This, uh, Henry, thanks for that comment, generating a huge uh, thing here. Again, we're very lucky, or Moodle has been very proactive and actually looked, at, in my opinion, in a very thorough way as to what a student can delete and access and where the student's contributing. But say, for example, um, a student in your first week in the class as part of orientation, you say, uh, okay, students, get on the, the discussion form and introduce yourself. Give me some information about yourself. That's personal data. So for me, we have to be able to actually have steps in place to manage that personal data. There are or there may be facilities where you can genuinely delete because of a student's right to be forgotten, delete student data, but does that compromise the data that is left behind? And this is where we need to start having more conversations on well, what exactly is meant by that? Uh, how, is, how is Henry using a discussion form versus how Alison is using it versus how Elizabeth is using it? And what data protection implications does that come up with? Um, we encourage our students now to be using e portfolios and maybe doing blog posts on external uh, engines. We've, we've made the, the conscious decision to provide Mahara as one of, one of the, the, the tools in Loop, provide that e portfolio functionality. But uh, are one of your organizations, uh, one of them, uh, insisting they use WordPress or insisting they use Weebly? And, and what are the data implications of that? So, yeah, there's a huge conversation that needs to be had about this and, and within your institution. Um, and we need to, to, to look at that. 
The last one, and this this really did make me laugh, the, the uh, higher education, HE, higher education institutions will not be fined because they're public bodies. Now, this was an incredibly intelligent colleague of mine. Um, but when he turned around and said that comment and said, sure, we're just taking money from one pocket into the other pocket. I said, we're not going to be doing that. I said, absolutely no way. All organizations are subject to elements of GDPR, including the fines and including everything that we do in terms of breaching it. And I used the example to answer this colleague and, and good friend of mine, so I'm not, not trying to belittle him by any stretch of the imagination. For data protection reasons, I won't mention his name. Um, but uh, I turned around and said, we have 17,000 plus students. So we have 17,000 uh, little princes and princesses, daddy's little princess and mammy's little princess and mammy's little prince and so on. And my own daughter, my uh, the princess is in here in fourth year uh, and finishing up now in the next week or so. Um, so when they get comments, when people use their data and maybe put comments on a feedback or on a discussion form or write some, one of those 17,000, their parents may be a solicitor. One of those 17,000 may take exception to, uh, to something that's said about them or something that's done to them, I say in inverted commas. So I actually think higher education, education institutions are actually exposed to be um, one of the, the sectors most vulnerable to GDPR prosecution. And I don't mean that um, vulnerable in, in how we manage our data, but I mean it in so far as the amount of people that will be putting in these requests and will be analysing exactly what we're doing. Um, because when we fail a student, we're essentially sending a message home to, to the parents um, to say, well, they weren't as good or they didn't meet the standards that, that we expect. And maybe that makes uh, upset that particular parent or that particular solicitor or what else have you. So I genuinely do think that HE institutions are at a risk and should take GDPR very, very seriously. And what I'd, I'd like to do really is, is end on that note just for a second to give you some time to um, contribute your opinion on, on that last point, uh, please, just in the discussion form. Just type in the, in, in the bottom, please. Don't be shy. See, there's no comments coming in, but feel free to to add in more comments. And again, do, uh, do you think that that uh, we will be more subject to to uh, prosecutions or, or uh, uh, scrutiny? Yes, yeah, good point, Vicky. Because we're charging fees, there is that whole students as customers. So, and and, and I'm not saying. Uh, nor am I saying that, that, that you agree with it either. I'm not saying that we should treat students as customers, not at all, but there is that perception. So I, I do think uh, GDPR uh, will apply, should apply, and by correlation, the fees, the breaches, um, the penalties, they will, they will also apply. Um, Let's put it down to, to I, I'll move on, but if, if anybody else has any specific comments, I'd be delighted to, to, to come back um, and, 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 and we can chat about them. But this, this, those myths essentially are um, different responses I've got from staff when going around to schools telling them about the legislation. So what I want to do now is, is <clears throat> move on to, and I, I refer back to Alison's dark data comment, Move on to storing data on your computer. Just one phrase, don't do it, right? Um, do, not on your personal computer. Uh, here in DCU, I'm sure it's the same in your own institutions. The laptops, the work laptops are encrypted. So they're safe and secure. And if, God forbid, if they're robbed or left on a bus or what else, 
remotely our IT guys can do some magic and turn that laptop into a brick. That it's no, it's no use to anybody, it's encrypted, they can't get in and, and do the data. Um, so just don't store your data on your personal computer. However, there are circumstances where uh, our staff have came to us and said, well, I don't have a staff computer. I have a staff PC, but I need to use my laptop in the class, or I do my correcting at home. Um, well, in that case, I would then use the cloud storage just recommended by the institution. So in our case, the cloud storage solution is Google Drive. That's recommended and has the appropriate security uh, constraints in place uh, that's offered by the university. They don't uh, support OneDrive. They don't support um, uh, Dropbox. So I would be encouraging, as, as, as good as they all are, those particular solutions, if it's not supported by your university, I would, I would look elsewhere, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, uh, mobile devices, as well as laptops, are an issue. Again, in DCU, we have, uh, uh, if you want to access your mail and your, your, your we all have Google accounts. So if you want to use your Google account on, on your mobile phone, you must sign up to the, the DCU privacy policy and it puts an encryption on your phone. But so many students send you data on their phone um, and their emails mightn't be secure and, and, and uh, encrypted and so on. So uh, storing data on your personal device, just be conscious of that and try wherever possible to use the university recommended or institution recommended system. There are reasons why they don't have a free for all and allow you to use all sorts of different bits and pieces. Um, <clears throat> This is what I call the name and shame. And this brought up the most contention uh, when I mentioned it to staff. And just to explain what I've done, and these are made up results and made up student numbers. But when I was in college in 1992, I first started, and um, my student number was 92768793. And I still remember my best friend's student numbers, and I still remember the person who was above me on the list and the person who was below me on the list. So that anonymized, I say in inverted commas, uh, spreadsheet that you place up on your notice board or you place up on your VLE isn't actually anonymous. It's what's called pseudo-anonymized. You can identify students. Their students can identify their fellow students on that grade. So that is actually a breach. That is a breach in legislation. There is one exception, which I will get to uh, later on, but that's a breach in legislation, so um, please don't do it anymore. Whether you use Blackboard, whether you use Canvas, whether you use Moodle, the VLE is the solution to do that. But what I can't emphasize enough is established practice doesn't make it right. Um, and, and the whole, oh, it didn't kill me, it made me stronger, or it made me more competitive, so I, I, I really wanted to see how I was doing. Established practice doesn't make it right. So please, what we're encouraging our staff to use is the VLE solution because, and I do appreciate that screen is a bit small, um, fictitious students there, Alex student, Kira student, Danielle student, Dar student, but when I put in 89 into uh, a grade for Dar, for Alex, only Alex sees that and only Kira sees her grade of 87 and only Danielle sees her grade of 90. What that does is it has an added bonus effect for our institution because we can identify students. This particular assignment, let's just say, was in week four. So we can identify students that are at risk in week four as opposed to waiting for the end of the semester when each lecturer takes their data off their own laptop on their own Excel spreadsheets and puts them all together into the student record system. So it's actually a win-win for us to use the VLE as a solution. Um, not only are you complying with legislation, but actually you can have a, a setup that allows your institution to intervene uh, or save, uh, and I say that in the comes, an awful lot easier. Um, I'm just saying, depending on your setup, if matrix numbers are used, 
email addresses often easy to reverse and look up names. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, it's so easy for data to be uh, non anonymous or sorry, pseudo anonymized and indeed retrospectively reversed. So the VLE is your solution. And people will say the VLE is dead, and I've heard that argument countless amounts of times. Now, at this age of data protection, it's even more reason why the VLE will go and continue to go from strength to strength because it is a secure institution provided and managed system um, to help manage that dark data again, just, just quoting a term from earlier on. In terms of data protection, and I, I am going to whiz through these because I'm conscious of the fact I've been rabbiting on for 45 minutes now. Um, the one thing that has came out here, I, I again won't read through them in, in, in uh, one by one, but to be forgotten. From a teaching and learning perspective, there's certain bits that you just can't forget. God, I know I'm still in therapy over some of my students. I'll never be able to forget them. I'm scarred for life. Or maybe they'll say to me they're scarred after I go to my classes. But uh, joking aside, um, there's some things that we just can't forget. If we are going to perform this contract for that we have with the student to provide this service um, of their qualification, we can't forget their assessment details. We can't forget their feedback details. So we just have a duty to explain to students why we're holding on to the data um, and, and uh, what we're doing with the data. We do need to give them that portability. And uh, again, we're very lucky with the platform that we've chosen that it will enable us to export the data, a student to export the data. But I do appreciate that that's um, different for, for every institution. But with Moodle, it's, it's, it has made the process very, very easy. And we're, we're delighted with that. Um, <clears throat> getting on to um, something that we haven't been as good as we should have been, um, or at least I couldn't stand over it, to be transparent with the students to explain to them what we're using the data for. Um, and if we are profiling the data to provide the logic or, or uh, the processing that's, that's involved. Um, but I come back to a comment I said in one of the first slides, when it comes to profiling, you are better off getting uh, consent as opposed to it going under your, your uh, um, going under the, the, the performance of a contract. What I, I want to do now is I'm going to finish off on uh, a couple of slides just to show you some real examples of what we have done pre-GDPR and what we'll be doing post-GDPR. So just looking at the diagram on the top left-hand corner, so the bar chart, or for anybody that's a chemist, that looks like an IR spectrograph. Um, <clears throat> that is our data, our Moodle data. Every click a student took on the VLE um, for the last six years. So what's that? One, two, three, four, five years. Um, but that's even though there's a unique identifier and it's not the student number, that's not anonymized data. However, we can look at it, we can anonymize the data and look at that and see uh, when we need most support or what the key features are of, of um, Moodle that's being used in this particular case. Um, when we can take the system down in order to roll it over to next year. All these sort of stuff. We can analyze that data absolutely no problem. The bottom uh, left graph, so the ones with the, the, uh, the sort of crooked lines, so the, the, that is a list of uh, modules, and I have them coded there um, accordingly, each one with its colored line. That tells us um, whether a student, how, how quick into the semester, based on student interactions, can we predict whether a student will be successful in that module or not. That's got specific student data in there. That's, we actually sent out an email to every student on a weekly basis saying, based on your current level of, of interaction with the VLE, when we compare it to our last five years of data, your chances of success are X. That's profiling. We need to uh, get consent from students for that. The biggest diagram on the page where we are looking at the use of the different elements across the same modules as it happened, but the different features within the VLE, that's anonymized. That's perfectly fine. We can use that data 
to improve the way we do our training, to improve the support we um, provide, but also to um, improve the course design when we're talking to individual lectures. Absolutely no problem, we can still do that. If we looked at the other data, and we looked at the, so the, the one on the left hand side, the colored data gives each student a rating out of nine based on their, their interactions. And we need to be careful on who has access to that data. But this start clicks, it's their, 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 their interactions with the, the modules. A different version, different visualization of the same data is in the top right hand corner. We're looking at for an individual student as opposed to the, the class list. But the individual student, we're looking at um, their interaction based on uh, the, the class average, essentially, to go with it. And, and just to, to, to reassure you, if you do manage to be able to see the size six font on the screen, though, uh, the, the data is fictitious. It's just, um, so don't worry about that whatsoever. The bottom right hand corner, and here's something that's performance of a contract, I would say, and though I, I would appreciate your opinions. Um, the performance, so in, in green gives the assignment deadline. If they've met the assignment deadline, uh, it goes green. If they've gone past the assignment deadline, it's red. So that's telling us whether students are at risk because of their assignments details. And indeed, the grade relative to other, um, to other students in the class, that's part of a contract. I think that's perfectly legitimate to end up doing that. And um, lecture capture, and I know it's a question that's in here, lecture capture and uh, webinars is a very interesting element. From a, a very basic, uh, let's start with the webinars. Uh, we now can see that Leo is here and Sima is here and Martin is here. And when somebody else looks at the recording, they'll be able to see that. So that's data. That's, that's attendance data. But it gets a little bit more complicated when that becomes what I call sensitive data. So biometric data. If Martin decides to speak or if Leo decides to speak or if Leo puts up an image of himself and that's in the recording, that opens up a whole can of worms. And also, uh, you, you, you should never have done it in the first place, but a lot of lecturers have done it where they have a webinar from 2017 and they share it with the 2018 students. But maybe the participants in this webinar actually gave their personal views or they had their, their voice was there or their video was there. Maybe they, they, they took over the webcam at some particular stage. Huge implications. Also, lecture capture. Somebody mentioned earlier on that it's default that the lecture capture is on for everybody. Well, that has to be signed off as part of the contract. I would personally would have arguments whether it is part of the service that's provided, but that's a stance your institution would have to take. You cannot, you absolutely cannot assume consent. So you would have to argue that as being part of the contract. That would be my opinion on that. Again, stating back, uh, I am not a lawyer, but my interpretation of it would be you cannot interpret, uh, you cannot assume consent for those recordings. So that would have to be stipulated from the onset. Okay. Um, there's my contact details, mark.glynn at dcu.ie. And as promised, uh, there is, sorry, I don't have it there, my apologies. Uh, I'll email out a link to the slide. I thought I actually had it in my last slides. Okay, uh, so well, I will. That was uh, a fascinating overview, and um, hopefully, the, the audience have um, got a number of questions answered. But we've got uh, a couple of minutes left if there are any follow up questions. Um, people would like to ask Mark. Um, obviously, this is quite a, a big and complex area. Um, so, hopefully, your I suppose one question is how are you all being supported within your own institutions? Or you know, are uh, are GDPR workshops available to you? Have you had much communication from senior management about GDPR? 
wonder, Mark, if um, you could perhaps say a couple of words about some of the practicalities at um, DCU about how you're approaching this. Or is it a mixture of workshops and communications to staff? Yeah, so um, a few of us have been, and I use this term very conscious of fact I'm being recorded, a few of us have been uh, volunteered uh, <laughs> to be your champions. In, in my role, it makes sense uh, for me to be involved, but there are, are representatives from each faculty and indeed from a selection of schools in different units that are GDPR champions and they have gone to uh, several training courses, I think six in total if I remember rightly. But equally from my perspective, I'm going around the 28 schools and essentially giving them a, a shortened version of this presentation. Um, so that's, that's uh, <clears throat> what we're doing. We will be putting in a statement uh, on GDPR for Moodle, Adobe Connect, Mahara, um, Arkant, and Unicam, that will go in the front page. So when the user comes on to Moodle on the, uh, what will be the 26th of May, um, they will have to tick the box um, to say that they are aware of this, that they accept these things. And, and, it's like that Ryanair policy that's on the, uh, that when you go try book a flight, when it won't let you move on to the next page until you take the box, they will not be able to um, participate in the learning technologies until they accept it. It's not a consent, it is part of a contract. And for each one of those elements, so for Adobe Connect, we will have, this is what we're using it for, this is where the DERVS is being stored, this is our data protection agreement with, with that company, and here's the contact name. So we will have that. We haven't collated that as yet, um, but we are we are getting there. For um, you mentioned some, you know, third-party tools like Padlet and, and Twitter. Is your approach to date to be to say to staff that you can't mandate the use of these tools to avoid? So we're asking them to re-examine why they're using them in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, not to say that the practice is bad by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, we want to make sure in all cases, and I say this with university-based uh, technologies as well as the, the free tools that's out there, that they always lead with the pedagogy. Mm -hmm. um, and in some cases, they, uh, they go, oh, this is the shiny new toy. This is the thing. I should use it because everybody else is using it, or I saw it at a conference and so on. Um, but we're then asking them to say, right, okay, well, be aware of what data is collected and, and why it's being collected. So in terms of Kahoot, say, for example, well, you're not asking them to sign up with their username and emails. And if you are, why are you doing it? What's, what's wrong with being anonymous? In the case of Twitter or Facebook, some people would say, well, it's, I, I don't use the VLE, I use Facebook instead because that's where all the students are. Well, in that case, you need special permission from the students to use it, or it's part of the contract, but they need to be aware when they sign up to the course that the transparency, they have to sign up to Facebook. Um, I don't know, it's just, there's no sort of golden rule that works works for it all. We have with, with Twitter and indeed Facebook, for example, shown lectures how to embed the feed from each one of those social media tools into Moodle which means that if you decide not to sign up to Twitter or not to sign up to Facebook, you're not missing out. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but again, we ask, we ask the lecturers, why are they using this? And why are they using this, this technology? And then why are they not using, is there not a university equivalent that they could use? I suppose another consideration is, whilst GDPR legislation has been um, basically on the books for at least a year, it, it's not been tested um, in, in court, so there's no case law around this. So I guess we're all still waiting to see what happens after the, the 25th of May in some some of these areas. It, it, it is, um, 
it's it's a it's a it's a labyrinth of different things. There's, there's so many different variants. It's hard to give a distinct answer. I'm noticing here with she, who I actually think I know who it is, uh, based on the questions that's been asked. Um, and indeed, he's forcing students to give their personal data to third parties beyond the institution. Good question. Um, I, if if I give you an example, we have a publisher, um, and it will. will we don't quite uh, use it, McGraw Hill. Um, uh, we've teamed up, uh, teamed up with our, our chemistry school, and first year assessment is based on well, one of the assessments is based on the online quiz material that's provided by McGraw Hill. So the third party that the, uh, the university is signing up for is, is the publishers. I know people get a bit touchy when you start talking about the Twitters and the Facebooks and all these sorts of things, but that's one. This one I just mentioned there, it's a third party, no different than um, the big social media companies in respect of sharing the individual data with them. Um, Mind Gardens uh, is a really interesting one. It's, that's psychometric testing. That's, that's gone a little bit deeper than asking somebody to, to uh, post a note on Padlet, which again can be anonymous. Um, there, there is the thing, and I definitely know who the G is based on their IP address and computer profile and so on. <laughs> uh, there, there is that argument, and I don't tend, I, I don't even dream of describing myself as as a, an IT expert. But like YouTube videos, say for example, if if the YouTube the student looks at YouTube and it's embedded on your 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 um. Uh, your noodle page or, or blackboard page or whatever your, your VLE of choice is, in theory they have, well it's not theory, in practice they have your IP address. I'm not sure how practical we can be by saying, well we're not sharing the IP address, so we're not, we're not allowing them to use video. I'm not sure how, how as I say, that will work out in, in, in practice versus, versus theory. Uh, as I say, I don't claim to have all the answers. I'm not a lawyer, so. I, I suppose there there's going to be a degree of the, you know, the, the sector working out the kind of terms of usage, um, you, you know, uh, in terms of the features of, you know, what do you include widgets, what information they're sending back, and. And what I what I love about the. Uh, the open source community. We were talking before everybody else joined us, uh, Martin and I, about open source. What I love about the open source community is we share that information. We share, oh, this is what I do, or this is what I've heard somebody else does. Um, and I would actively encourage people through Alt and through whatever other networks you have, is to share what you do. Um, because that's how we will learn from one another. I think the worst thing we could do is actually ignore GDPR legislation. I think we have to actively try and address it and, and address it up front and then um, share our experiences. I think if we uh, don't get it right first time around or indeed second time around, I, I, I don't think the fines will be as harsh as if we had totally ignored it. And decides not to do it. So I think try something. Yeah, I wouldn't assume. Um, somebody mentioned about presuming it's policy, so it's okay. Um, you need to check that the policy is actually accurate and takes account the new legislation for GDPR. Um, if Padlet and Kahoot are GDPR compliant, um, you need to explain to students what you're doing with them, and you need to, if there's an exchange of data, Beyond, notwithstanding the comment I said about the IP address, but if there is exchange of institutional data like um, student number and email address, um, you need to have a data protection agreement in place with them. Um, well, I'm conscious of time, um, so I, I'd just like to, to, to thank you, Mark, for um, uh, taking time to um, share um, some of the really valuable. Um, piece of information that you, you picked up along the way. Um, I, I suppose one of the big takeaways is what GDPR is helping us to do is being more transparent uh, about how we use data, how we collect data within learning and teaching. And um, I think that's um, 
a great conversation to be having. Um, so thank you very much, Mark. And as I mentioned, um, we'll put a recording up on the event page and um, we'll also include uh, Mark's link to his slide as well. So thank you very much, Mark. No, no problem at all. And as I said, I, I don't claim to be a lawyer, but if I can help out with advice from experience, I'm more than welcome to.